It feels like a huge missed opportunity. Hello and welcome back to Frillnet and welcome to the video you've all been waiting for. Ever since Hyperia, the UK's tallest and fastest roller coaster opened at Fort Park, my notifications have been inundated with people going on about how it's world class, how it's by far the best coaster in the UK top five in Europe material. And then you've got me who made a video when the name of this roller coaster was first announced with a thumbnail with the words, this is terrible on it. <laughs> but finally, on Monday the 19th of August, I had the opportunity to ride the goddess herself, which means it's finally time for me to share my thoughts on whether I think Hyperia lives up to the hype, whether it's the best coaster in the UK, and whether it is world class. Our experience actually begins on the way to the park as you can actually spot this ride from the M25 and I believe a couple of the surrounding motorways as well because of its sheer size and immediately you hit with wow this is actually pretty impressive and then we make our way past Colossus, past Sword of Ride, past Samurai into the area in which the ride is hosted in. When you step into this area, you see the ride's entrance right in front of you, consisting of a large sign with wings either side, with obviously the ride's logo incorporating a wing-like emblem. And then to the left, you've got a gift shop known as the Hyporium, as well as a small stage, which is used to host a show known as The Legend of Hyperia, which goes into some detail regarding the ride's backstory. And to your right, you've got everyone's favourite, a Burger King. This is also not to mention the incredible soundtrack composed by Ima Score, which is probably my second favourite ride soundtrack of all time, with only the soundtrack for Helix at Leesburg, which is also composed by Ima Score topping it. This soundtrack really is incredible. It really encompasses the epic scale of this ride, how much it means to the UK theme park industry, while also doing a great job to tell the ride's admittedly very loose backstory through music. Speaking of the ride's backstory, this is essentially based around a goddess who is obviously known as Hyperia, who is stranded on an island and has a fear of water, meaning that she's too scared to escape the island, but gradually she manages to gather courage forge some wings and take off into the skies, flying off the island, over the water and, assumingly, to the mainland. The ideology behind the ride is that this goddess is essentially acting as a beacon of inspiration. A blazing beacon of inspiration ignites within me. I wonder what that was inspired by, eh? Encouraging you to face your own fears and take on the roller coaster hence it is named after it. A common criticism of Hyperia has been that the queue line and surrounding area features little to no theming in relation to this backstory. And yes, people are right regarding this. However, in my opinion, this isn't really an issue because at the end of the day, you've got a massive roller coaster there that should be able to sell itself on its own. Speaking of the queue line, there's very little to say here as it's essentially a massive cattle pen that goes underneath the ride. Very similar to that of the Smiler at Alton Towers. You do though have a few screens dotted around the ride which show things such as construction footage and pre-boarding information regarding how to sit in the trains and pull down the restraints and secure them. You eventually reach the station building which has clearly been inspired by Icon at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. In fact, the whole stylization, I guess you could call it, of this ride has clearly been heavily inspired by Icon. Hyperion Station is essentially a massive shoebox, except it's gold instead of grey, and it does have the emblem of the wings plastered over various parts of it. And in terms of the interior, that's nothing too spectacular either. It's a lot of just black walls with the logo plastered over them in certain places. However, there are some lights on the edges of the station platform, in the ceiling, and on the edges of where the train exits the station as well, which are part of a nice dispatch sequence. With Hyperia obviously being manufactured by Mac Rides, the trains are similar to what can be found on Icon at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, along with the other Mac launched and hyper coasters around the world. However, they don't have seat belts like Icon's trains have. And I did also notice the restraints to feel a bit more roomy compared to Icon as well. 
meaning that it's easier to get airtime and not get stapled. Speaking of stapling, unlike on Icon at Blackpool, the staff don't seem to staple on Hyperia whatsoever, which is really nice. When they're checking the restraints, they'll kind of just tug it ever so slightly, you know, push it slightly. They won't push it and push it and push it down like some of the Icon staff do, which really annoys me. But once the train's ready to dispatch, you'll get a nice announcement from the goddess which says something along the lines of restraints locked, wings forged, it's time to find your fearless. And then you get some brilliant dispatch audio as the train dispatches. There's a projection on the side of the station, the smoke that gets released and there's a little lighting sequence as well. It's nothing to write home about but it really is a nice touch. You then proceed into an outer bank turn to the right which doesn't give any spectacular forces, obviously, the train's moving really slowly, but it just gives you a nice bit of lateral force. It's a bit of a teaser as to what's to come. You then have some amazing lift hill audio that triggers on cue as the dispatch audio ends and really starts to build up some tension as you travel towards the lift hill. The speaker's going all the way up this lift hill, meaning you can very clearly hear this audio as you start to traverse up it and the tension just gets more and more the further up you climb. In terms of the views you get from this lift hill, there's nothing really that spectacular to see. A lot of it, if you look into the right and forward, is just lakes and the surrounding area. It's not quite as special as on Big One where you can see all the way into Blackpool, the entire park, if you just look slightly to your right. However, you can get a view of the rest of Fort Park if you look to your left and behind. And right on cue, as you reach that top point, 236 foot up in the air, the bass on the soundtrack just drops and then you plummet down the first drop and it's just so in sync it's just a beautiful moment and as for the drop itself what can i say it really is incredible even if you sat mid train you will get some nice ejector air time down it but if you're on the back oh boy you are out your seat for a good two to three seconds until you hit the bottom the 180 degree twist in the drop really adds to it as well it gives you some nice lateral whip similar to what you get on the big one's first drop except it's even more extreme here. Remember before when I said this ride has elements similar to what can be found on Icon at Blackpool Pleasure Beach? Well, the Junior Immelman that follows the first drop is an example of this. Icon has a Junior Immelman right after the second launch, and it's one of, if not the best elements on the ride. Hyperia's Junior Immelman is even better than Icon's in terms of forces, and it's actually one of the weaker elements on the ride, which just goes to show, in case you couldn't tell already, how much of an intense and amazing experience Hyperia really is. Mac have profiled this Junior Immelman to absolute perfection. You flung up into it, but by the time you reach the top, the track is already twisted out into a neutral position, meaning it essentially carries the same force as an airtime hill. So you are flung out your seat when you reach the top of this thing, and you're out your seat all the way down until you hit the bottom. Bearing in mind this Junior Immelman is over 100 feet tall, you've got a good more two seconds of sustained ejector airtime. But moving on to the next element on Hyperia, and I'm going to say it, this is the greatest element I have ever experienced on a roller coaster. It's the element that still doesn't have an official name yet. But yeah, it's essentially a massive airtime hill that's banked slightly that goes into an inversion and essentially acts as a turnaround for the ride. And honestly, I was blown away at this point. The ejector airtime on it was so strong, and I'm not gonna do this now because I wanna keep this video PG, but it was so much so that I had a wardrobe malfunction on it both times I rode the ride. Like, half of my lower stomach was exposed because my hoodie just got flung up into the air. So, yeah, hope no one saw that. But in case you couldn't tell, you get some very strong, sustained ejector airtime. And I've genuinely never felt anything like it. This literally goes on for what feels like forever as well. Like, you are properly pushed against your restraint for a good four to five seconds. It's actually stronger towards the front of the train than the back of the train because 
towards the front of the train you get pushed up into it however if you are on the back of the train you get more of the benefit of the whip from the inversion on the way down out of this element which is just as incredible as the airtime a contender for the best inversion i've ever experienced on a coaster therefore it's no surprise that that combined with the airtime just makes this element incredible the best two things on a coaster a rare time and whipping inversions. But we then move on to a zero G stall with a dive loop exit out. And this element was hyped up to me a lot. A lot of people were saying online that this is their personal highlight and that it's potentially the world's best zero G stall on a coaster. And don't get me wrong, it was a very good element and probably the second best on the ride. But I can't help but feel it was a tad overhyped. Nevertheless, this stall provides some amazing floater airtime for a good two or three seconds as you're hanging upside down. And this is unfortunately where things take a turn for the worst with the ride. After exiting the dive loop out of the zero G stall, you hit a splashdown. Now this splashdown wasn't working when I rode the ride. However, the splashdown is not the issue. What's the issue is that this splashdown has some trim brakes that slow the ride down. And these trim brakes are the sharpest trim brakes I have felt on a coaster ever. Even sharper than the trim brakes on 13's first drop. The world's steepest brake run as named by Josh from Theme Park Mad. Check out his channel once you've finished watching this video. These brakes are so sharp that you are forcibly flung forward in your seat and it just really is a big turn off for me. You know, Hyperia really was turning me on with that drop, that inward that out of banks inversion thingy and then that stall and then she just had to suddenly turn me off didn't she but after hitting those trim brakes you then enter another off axis twisted airtime hill thingy which just feels like a bit of a whimper compared to the elements that come before it don't get me wrong it does still give some nice airtime which could be considered ejector. And if we're comparing it to the likes of other airtime focus coasters in the UK, such as Icon, then I'd still say it's superior. However, it's not on the world-class level of the elements that come beforehand. And the same goes for the final airtime hill, which is copied straight from Stealth. I don't know how Thorpe haven't learned from Stealth that an airtime hill that goes straight into a brake run does not serve its purpose because as soon as you slow a train down, it kills all of the airtime, especially if you sat towards the back. But no, Hyperia unfortunately has the exact same effect. In fact, I'd say that Stealth's final airtime hill into its brake run is actually better. Never mind though, because it's straight off down the steps into the Hyporium shop where you've got a photo unit where you can collect all your photos and not a lot of merch because unfortunately it seems like a lot of it was sold out when I was on park. Upon entering the shop I was also greeted by the lovely sounds of the Legend of Hyperia show going on outside. Unfortunately I didn't get a chance to watch that during my visit however I will be back at Fort Park during October therefore I'll definitely make sure I catch it then. But Hyperia, what can I say? Two thirds of it is absolutely world class. The best moments I have ever experienced on a roller coaster. And I don't really think there's that much competition. However, it's just all over too quickly. It feels like a huge missed opportunity to create potentially what may be considered one of the best roller coasters in the world. Don't get me wrong, I can see why people say on the European stage it is brilliant and it is by far the best coaster in the UK. I can currently confirm that it sits in my number two spot with regards to my favourite roller coasters of all time. The only roller coaster that currently tops it is Tutatis at Park Asterix. While Tutatis' elements are arguably less impressive than Hyperia's, they are still incredibly thrilling, forceful and airtime filled such that when you take its length into account and it's quite a bit longer than Hyperia, 
it just has more to give overall. I think if Hyperia was 15 to 20 seconds longer and it didn't have that awful trim break, then it probably would top to Tatis. One final thing I would like to address is Hyperia's presentation, which as I kind of alluded to before when discussing its relatively limited theming, has had a lot of criticism online. Now, don't get me wrong, it does still look like a bit of a construction site. Originally, the park had planned to install a plaza close to the exit where you'd get to look over, you know, a nice picturesque lake at the ride. However, due to what I can only assume are budgeting reasons, those plans got scrapped and along with it, I feel like a lot of presentation details. Underneath the ride doesn't look too great at the moment. It's basically a massive bog with a pond in the middle. However, I feel like people are being way too harsh. Like, come on, we've waited 30 years for the big one at Blackpool Pleasure Beach's height record to be topped. And that's finally been done with what is an incredible roller coaster. Give it time, those trees will grow through and the area will look nicer as a result of that. And I'm sure maybe some flowers and whatnot, some planters will get put in over time. But it's not just huge roller coasters that are scary at Thorpe Park. Fright Nights is just around the corner which provides scares of its own. Which is why you want to go and check out this video on the right side of your screen. It's last year's vlog from Fort Park Fright Nights where I give my full in-depth review and first reactions to that event. And for more things theme park related in the UK and beyond, make sure you click the icon in the centre of your screen to subscribe.